Hello. Hey, people. How are you? Um, I am so excited about our guest today, um, Curtis Merriweather. He is not a um, he, he is not a stranger to us. He has um, been with us in our class before and he is the bomb.com and an awesome friend of mine. Uh, he is yeah, he oh, there he is. OK, so yes, he is going to share today. He can share about a lot of things. Let's be clear. He can share about investing. He can share about franchising. He can share about winning multi-million dollar contracts. He can share about all kinds of things. But today he is going to talk to us a little about um, the opportunities that exist for barbers and stylists and cosmetologists in the federal um, marketplace. And this was very strategic um, and, and we share these conversations all the time. We always run into people who believe that they don't have a product or a service that the federal government buys. And for that reason, um, we started doing some of these um, subjects um, some of these conversations, contracts and conversations around different subjects that you wouldn't normally, you know, consider. OK, and this is one of them. And so I'm excited. We are streaming live. So we have our Zoom going on, um, but we are streaming live onto into our Facebook group as well. So, um, Curtis, we will monitor because we have more people watching on Facebook. Um, we will monitor the chat and give you any questions that come up on there. Um, but welcome, sir. It is, you know, it is good, good to see you. <laughs> Always good to see you. Always good to see you. I did, um, and we can we can do this however you want. I do have our um, generic presentation that we give for barbers and cosmetologists, kind of an intro. Oh, just... we can use free flow. It doesn't matter to me. You know, I can I can get in wherever I fit in. I want you to do your thing. I want you to share your screen, do your thing, explain to the folks um, what this looks like. And I, I want to, I'm going to be off screen. I'm going to let you have the stage and go ahead and share. Okay. I can't, it says I can't share. Okay. I think um, Jasmine might be able to uh, make you, I don't know, co host or something. Amazing. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Always Is good you? to see you. you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you well. Awesome. Yeah, no, Is he able to share? You might have to take me away from being host for a minute and put him on this host. I don't know if we can do multiple people. Oh, let me see. Boom. All right. There it awesome. is. There it is. All right. Cool. Now. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yep. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I just want to say, first of all, Serena and Jasmine, always good to see you good people. I just finished my, my second to my last semester of my PhD program, so I'm extremely excited. And when Serena called me up, I said, I'd love to talk about this, because I just want to see people who look like us. Now, I am an equal opportunist. I do not discriminate. But I want to see people who look like us, especially to the bag and um for, for those that, that that may not know me i am curtis merriweather as serena so um, eloquently explained uh, i've been in the government contracting space now for over 20 years i have not been an entrepreneur for the entire 20 plus years i started government contracting at 17. Um, i did not know at 17 years old that that's what i was doing if we're just being honest i started out in the document control room making copies um, and then all through college, I ended up launching a, or landing a, a, a computer engineering apprenticeship. I studied engineering at the University of South Carolina, so I'm a game guy, so don't hold that against me. Um, but I, um, I found myself um, in entrepreneurship in 2010. And I've been doing this for quite some time. So I've been around this space for a while, picking up different things along the way. Uh, and my spouse is a cosmetologist. And when we, I'm, I'm, I haven't been, this is my second marriage. My first spouse passed away. So in this new marriage, she was like, I see all these things that you're doing and is there opportunity for me? And honestly, I said, but the government is not buying barber and cosmetology services, but boy, was I wrong. <laughs> so 
she challenged me and I took the challenge and we found out that the government does buy Barbara and cosmetology um, services. Also, especially for my cosmetologists, if you're a cosmetology instructor, they also buy those services as well. So I'm I'm going to get through this. I don't know how much time I got, but I want to make this time as productive and meaningful as possible while I have you guys. I'm going to probably share some things that you may not have even been aware of, which is the which is the purpose. I'm also going to give you an opportunity that if you want to take our class, I'm going to offer a special one time only today a discount for that class just for Serena's people. Um, for those who want to take advantage of it, it'll be available. If not, that's not a problem either. But whether you are in uh, Barbara Cosmetology Services or not, I think I'm going to share some things today that will probably change your perspective. So without further ado, now this is some historical data. Um, this is a 2019 that, you know, for, for those who I know follow Serena, you know, we're into 2022 fiscal year. Federal government is on a October 1 through September 30th fiscal year. They do not operate on the calendar year. Most of our businesses operate on the calendar year. But this is some historical data. In 2019, the federal government spent $4.45 trillion. Now, if you've been following any of the news, and you've been seeing the infrastructure bills and things that are being uh, proposed by the executive office right now. Those packages are in the trillions. That is way in excess today of what we have seen spent historically. So, like I said, this is some this is some historical data, but this just gives you an idea of what the government is spending. Um, again, these this is a couple of years ago, but you saw this was a uh, 2019 data. This is not numbers I made up. This came from the Office of Management and Budget. Um, Office of Management and Budget does just that. They manage the resources of the federal government and keep account from an accountability perspective of the money that's spent. So you see $727 billion, 61% of that budget at that time went to the military. You got 1% going to agriculture, 2% unemployment. But all that's important. You guys are very smart people. You can read the pie chart. But what I thought was interesting was I took that $4.5 trillion. Now, this is this is composed of the mandatory budget and the discretionary budget. We're not going to go real deep in that um, today, just for the sake of time. But the portion that you guys are mainly concerned about as government contractors and subcontractors is the discretionary budget. And that was $1.19 trillion. But I took the aggregate just to give you an idea of how much money the government is spending. Because we see big numbers like 4.5, and sometimes we don't even have a, a, a notion of how big that is. So in 2019, the fiscal year, which was October 1, 2018, through September 30th of 2019, um, that was their fiscal year, they spent $4.5 trillion in that, in that fiscal year. That was equivalent to $375 billion dollars a month. That was $86 billion weekly. And that's 2 billion, 2.1 billion an hour. So 4.5 trillion seems so far off. So I want to give you some numbers that maybe you can, I mean, I probably could have went down to seconds and it would have been so many millions of dollars per second. So that gives you an idea of the opportunity. All right. So this is a big you know, if you know anything about government contracting, I know you can't read all this, but this is what we call a uh, a capture strategy. There's about 121 steps in this. Now, I put this up to show you uh, how for, for folks to come up with a 121 step process. Now, these are the big companies. These are Lockheed Martins, the CACIs. You know, you're you're a couple million dollar company. Ten million. They're not doing this, but you can, this gives you an idea of how deliberate they are with this process. So this process, if you if I blew it up, you would see all these different phases. They would talk about project initiation. You would see them talking about shaping and when things. But the thing here is in this in this course, and whether you take this course or not, the thing you need to figure out is how to do what we call capturing work. How do we win work? And this is a strategy. It's not the strategy. It is a strategy. So whether you're taking classes with me or whether you're learning with Serena, Serena is giving you a, strat a strategy. She's giving you a capture strategy, whether you realize that's what you're getting or not. But it's a, it's a specific plan for how you're going to win work, whether that's the DIB system or whether you're in the open market competing with us out here in the services space. There's a strategy you have to employ. Nothing just happens. It has to be a deliberate process that's repeatable and consistent that you can follow 
on a semi-consistent um, basis. Next slide. Now, before I get into it, I just want to show, and again, this is some historical data that I just pulled. I have not pulled this information recently, but you're starting to see, I'm not making these things up. You see contract numbers, call award ID, you see recipients, and you see some colleges in there. You see some individuals by name. Um, so you're seeing that regular people are getting these contracts. And look at some of these dollar amounts, 237,000. Um, 205,000, 93,000, 58,000, 57,000, And some of you guys are working in the barbershop and salons and please keep doing it. But, you know, if you've been watching the news, we have a new, a new variant variant. I'm from Georgia though. So every night day my Georgia will come out. We have a new variant coming on the scene. As you guys know, from what happened when we had the previous, um, uh, the initial COVID, it caused a lot of barbers and salons to shut down. But my wife, who happens to be a full um, a licensed master cosmetologist, was not, a, not, was not affected by that because she was making money through the federal government. She makes more money doing one, um, she does wigs, one wig order than most people make in a shop a day. I'm going to say that again, in a, in a week, excuse me. She makes one more money in one wig order than most people make in their shop all week. Let that sink in. So if she was processing a few orders a week, she was not impacted by the pandemic. So let that sink in. Let me go on about my business. One of the things we're going to, I just want to kind of introduce to you some things that you may have never heard before. When you're talking about winning business. Now, folks who know me know that I'm primarily a federal government contracting person. These same strategies can be employed in the commercial marketplace can be employed at the state and local level. But this is one of the graphics. I love this chart. And we're not gonna do a deep dive in here because we don't have time. But you gotta figure out how you're gonna win. Are you gonna win based on cost or we hear price? Or are we gonna win based on being differentiated? Or differentiated is a big fancy word for saying being different, being unique. Um, and we're either competing in a broad market or a narrow market. So we gotta figure out where to play, broad market or narrow market, just talking about the size of the market, or are we competing on price? Those are, this is two, this, we call it a two by two in business school. So I have the top cost leadership. Think of your Walmart. I'm gonna give some retail examples because that's the, those, those we can all kind of get a base on. Um, differentiated, this may be your, um, this may be your, 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 your Neiman Marcus or your Nordstrom. Each one, each company that you see in society today is in one of these categories. And the better they define who they are and make sure that message pervades throughout the company, the more competitive they're going to be. All right, let's, let's keep moving. Here, here's some things that, that you have to do in the company if you're gonna just do business in the federal space. Number one, you gotta register. And I know Serena's probably harped on this. Number two, you gotta have a marketing statement development. Number three, you gotta know who to contact. Number four, you got to establish contact typically via email. Here's the reality. In this space, I showed you historical numbers, $4.5 $4 trillion. There's a lot of people vying to try to get in this space. So how are you going to set, how are you going to set yourself apart? You got to understand contracts and rates. And then you got to perform. Because if you don't perform, there will not be a repeat opportunity. So the things that I teach and the things that Serena teaches is designed to make you competitive in this very competitive landscape where there's tons and tons of opportunity. Government contracting literally, truly changed my life, truly. I'm the guy who grew up on free and reduced lunch. I'm the guy who grew up wearing his uncle's hand-me-downs. There was no silver spoons here. Um, I invested a lot in my education, and that's why I love the things that Jasmine and Serena are doing, because they're trying to make these things that, quite frankly, have been unobtainable and inaccessible for many that make making the bed. And it's not that these areas were, you know, so hard to get into. It's just we didn't know. You know, the scriptures say that we're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Um, I am a follower of Christ. Not perfect, but I am a follower of Christ. And it also says that a lot of the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Final scripture, one of my favorite ones, it says 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish that you all may prosper, but that you may be in health as your soul. All those scriptures talk about what you do or do not know. So I often, you know, I'm the son of a pastor, y'all, if, if I didn't tell you that before. So I remember growing up in church and I would oftentimes see people who love God, you know, spirit filled, fire baptized, shouting, 
fucking run. <laughs> and they would not have the resources. And I remember as a little kid, I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why all these people who love God were in, I call it first struggle ministry. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand how we be connected to the source. I don't even know how I got over here, y'all. But I don't understand how we was connected to the source of all resources and we were in lack. It didn't make sense to me. When I read that he was the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, it did not make sense to me. And in many cases, I think that's what kind of caused me to deviate from the church because I didn't, I didn't leave God, but I did not understand the religion. I didn't understand that the church, the pastor was saying, I'm supposed to have the abundant life. But then when I looked at people in the church, I didn't, I didn't see abundance. It didn't, it didn't make sense to me. So I said, I'm, I'm going to go all the way in and into entrepreneurship. What I did not realize is that entrepreneurship is just so much of calling us the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. Somebody got to make the pro for the vision. Somebody got to bring the resources in. And it's, it's teachings like this that if we get a hold of that now we can truly make a mark in our communities. We can truly make a mark in our families. We can get our kids better educated. We can create true generational wealth. I don't know how I got this real. Let me get back on my slides. <laughs> but here's some real world examples. If we go back two slides back, I, we talked about where to play and how to win. So I want to give you some real world examples. And these are government contracting examples. Let me disregard the slides. Cost leadership, you'll probably see a Walmart there. And the whole premise here is to produce and market a good quality at a lower price. I don't know how many guys may remember the commercial, the Walmart, you would see the falling prices. So Walmart established themselves as, if I'm gonna jump back between slides, as a cost leader. So they competed on, on cost in a very broad market. Walmart sells everything almost. They got, they got grocery and they got department items you can buy you can go get your, your car serviced <laughs> you can get you a brand new tv you can go get some milk and some cookies i mean you can get everything at walmart so cost leaders differentiated and some of you might not know these companies so we're gonna instead of looking at bowen who's a great example some of you guys may know these companies instead of looking at bowen think about your Amy marcus think about your nordstrom they create a product or service that is perceived as being unique. Now, the thing that business owners often fail to realize, they think they get to determine if their stuff is unique. You don't get to determine it. That's determined by your, by your consumer. And they let you know if it's unique because normally a differentiated company, they, it's a higher price that's being offered. And it doesn't matter if we're talking product or service, we're talking competitive advantage, we're talking business strategy. So many people want to get up and just go start a company and not have put any thought into how they're going to do what they do. How are they going to stand apart? What is their value proposition in the market? And then last but not least is a focus company. Now, this can be cost-focused or differentiated focus. But for the sake of our example, um, we're going to talk about Dollar General. Most of y'all have heard of Dollar General or Dollar Tree. They address a focus segment of the marketplace. And, and they provide a competitive advantage because they do what they do in that sector better than anybody. Dollar General, you know you're going, it's going to be a dollar. And I always get them confused. I don't, it's Dollar General, Dollar Tree. But one of them, everything's a dollar. Everything's a dollar. Dollar General, Dollar Tree. I always forget. My wife always corrects me. No, it's not one. But we up to a dollar twenty-five now, Curtis. Okay. We at a dollar hey. twenty-five store now. Inflation. Inflation. <laughs> Inflation. But you guys get the idea. Your company falls in one of these three categories or four, because remember, we combine cost focus and differentiated focus. And so you don't go to Chick-fil-A expecting um, hamburgers. That's not what they do. They have put their value proposition out, out in their pricing. They put it out in their messaging, in their marketing, and you know that. But the thing that I see among government contractors, and especially the barbers and stylists, are making sure they do the same thing with their business. Whether you do government contracting or not, you still have to identify who you're going to be in the space. One, I'm married to a cosmetologist, and one of the things I see when she lectures all across the country on these things, the thing I see is oftentimes we, we, we compare prices. So if they're charging, and again, I'm not a barber cosmetologist, if someone is charging $85 for a relaxer, you're charging and not even understanding the reason for why your cost is what it is, other than someone else is charging that and you want to be competitive or your price may be a little higher or maybe a little lower because that's how you think 
you have to compete in the marketplace. So these are the things that we try to uh, try to educate barbers and stylists on. So I think I didn't really come here to give you guys a marketing message. So let, let me let me just talk. Um, and I don't want to have a price because that that don't that don't even matter because I'm gonna give you guys a special today. Um, but let's just talk. One of the things I really want to see is I want to see my barbers and cosmetologists get from behind the chair. It, the, 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 one of the worst things that I oftentimes see, and I'm gonna stop this. One of the things I oftentimes see is I, I matter of fact, I have a relative, I have a relative who's a, who was a great barber in his twenties. Now my cousin, talented barber, is almost in his sixties, and because no one told him about how to um, create opportunities with the government or commercially, he is a slave behind that chair. You know, most stylists. Their dream is to have their own shop, but the reality is that you can't you can't work forever, and your revenue is often tied to how how much you pump that chair. So what we're my, myself as well as uh, Serena, what we're trying to do is now show um, communities, socially economic communities that have not had access to these opportunities, how to get a hold of them, and a lot of the times first step is just a just recognizing that opportunity even exists. So for my females, you say, okay, he told me earlier that I can make more money processing one order than I could work in a week. What does that look like? One order um, with the with the with the federal government could be fifteen hundred dollars for a cranial prosthesis. That's the medical term for a wig. They don't call it a wig; they call it a cranial prosthesis. So whether you whether you're selling the DOD or whether you're selling to the Health and Human Services, when they process that order, they call it a cranial prosthesis. So that's the medical term for a wig. And my brother said, man, what, what about the barbers? Well, even at some agencies, they recognize that post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, that many of you guys know of, they realize that there's a link between it and hair loss, both for men as well as for women. Now, women, we've known about alopecia and trichothymia, this big word I can't say. Um, we know about those conditions. And I know the, the, the stylist on the, on, the, on the line probably laughing at me because I, I butchered that word up. But the reality is the, the those conditions have been documented and there are there are um, remedies available at the government's expense to make sure that their patients have what they need to maintain self-esteem, to keep their mental health intact. Because in most times people serve this country and when they serve the country, things sometimes sometimes things just happen to them. So the federal government has put their money on the line to provide this service to their patients. And these are processed via purchase order. So you don't even have to go through the whole process of, you know, um, going through the bidding process or looking for the opportunities. We give you a list of all of the customers in the, in the and we focus on one agency, all the customers in um, for the agency we focus on, we give you the name, phone number, email address. Now, sometimes the list does change, people move. We don't always get the updates right away, but we point you in the right direction. Most of that list is, 85% accurate. But as you can imagine, every time someone moves or relocates, they don't always update the list. So sometimes we have to help our clients find who the new point of contact may be. But when I got started in government contracting, there was no one providing the list. There was no one providing a roadmap. All we had was the, the procurement technical assistance centers, which based on what state you're in, some are not that great. It's all based on who's there. And when you start getting into complex things like this, they don't have a clue. Like matter of fact, I had someone who was looking at taking our class, and they went to the GT, they went to the uh, to the procurement office, and they said, "I'm trying to figure out how to do that." And they said, "That don't that doesn't exist." I said, "Well, I can show you a whole bunch of um, task orders that say it do." <laughs> but like, oftentimes, like like I said, I had been in this space for well over um, almost a decade as an entrepreneur, and two decades as uh, you know, if you go back to look at when I became an employee and I didn't even know it existed. So sometimes people just can't tell you what they don't know. They're not trying to mislead you. They just don't know. And these orders are processed. What I really like about it is they're processed in advance. So when the government says, hey, I want Serena to process this cranial prosthesis unit for um, Jasmine Leonard, they send, you, they, send you, they send you the package. They give you an opportunity to give them a quote on what your price is. We provide pricing guidance. And just, just, just so you guys know, we don't charge the whole 1500. 
because can I get an order at 1500 but I want it to provide value back to the government. So I charge around about $1,000. Now, with, a, with the result of things that are happening um, with inflation, the cost of raw goods are going up. So I just send a note to the customer and say, hey, because of the supply chain, because of the, hair, the price of laces went up, I am temporarily increasing my price. And here are the reasons why. The government still go ahead and process. Now, here's the thing that I like about it. A lot of stylists don't even give themselves a raise uh, every every year. They don't keep up with inflation. So if you look around, they've been charging the same price for the last five years. They haven't given themselves a raise, but the price of goods is going up. Go into your local grocery store and look and see what baking costs these days. The world is moving forward. Inflation is real. But the cool thing about the federal government is they, they expect what we call escalation. This is, or CPI, consumer price increase. That's the index if, you, if you're if you an economics type. So they expect that three to 5% increase every year. So you don't even have to, you ain't got to try to convince your, your, your uh, consumer, Mr. Federal Government, of why you need to increase. They, they already expect it. You don't have to worry about your customer leaving because you went up on your prices. They expected you to, long as you got reasonable justification. So that's one of the real reasons why Keenan and I, as my wife, Keenan and I love this space uh, because we can actually process these orders on the go. We don't have to have a full service line anymore. And we learned the real value of this space when COVID happened. When I was looking on the news and seeing the salons in places like California that were shut down, and I would see our elected officials go into those salons because they were public officials, uh, but yet, the they were the, the the salon owners were were forced to just maybe you know service a couple people that they kind of did illegally because the regulations did not allow them to. But in the midst of all that, we were still processing orders because the reality was even though a lot of the offices were were shut down because we were all in this COVID pandemic environment, people the 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 patients were still going into these offices and still getting prescriptions written. That's what that's what they are. They were diagnosed with having hair loss. And when they got diagnosed to get hair loss, those orders were still coming, even in the midst of the pandemic. Was that good or what? I am so glad that you took the time to uh, to watch that video. And listen, we have goodies for you. Don't forget to look inside of the description box because there are other ways that we can stay connected and you can continue to learn and grow with us, okay? And then also make sure you like, subscribe, comment. Tell me what your greatest takeaway was from today's video. Tell me where you're from. Let's connect, okay? I wanna see you go get it. So let's Let's go get it.